Well, Romans chapter 3, we're looking at verses 23 down to verse 26 today. And this is what the Word of God says. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Let's pray one more time and ask the Lord to bless our time together. Father, we humbly come before you today. We thank you and we praise you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. We thank you and we praise you, Lord, for this day that we can come together and assemble as your church to hear your word, to lift up our voice and our hearts in praise to you, to acknowledge all that you are for us in Christ. We pray, God, as we gaze upon the beauty of your law, your word, Father, that in looking upon the perfect law of liberty, Lord, that we might walk in that glorious liberty of the truth of Jesus Christ who was crucified and risen again. Father, we pray that you would use this passage and to remind us of the glorious gift that you have given to mankind, that through your Son, sinners may be redeemed. And remind us, Lord, of the awesome reality today of your wrath against sin. We pray that you would help us now, grant us understanding and illumination. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, as you're seated, I just wanted to introduce this sermon by stressing that what we're looking at today in Scripture is the concept of wrath and redemption. And really, that concept is very important because there, are, there couldn't be two more diametrically opposite ideas in the Bible than wrath and and redemption. On the one hand, wrath is the terrible judgment of God. Wrath is that judgment that comes to sinners because they have violated the law of God and will be meted out on the day of judgment where all mankind, Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 to 15, says that all mankind will be gathered around the throne of God, and there they will be recompensed for every deed they have ever done. The books will be opened, and another book will be opened, which is the book of life, so that whoever's name is not found written in the Lamb's book of life will be cast in the lake of fire. And that is the ultimate, what we talked about previously in Romans, the eternal wrath of God. And what is the answer to the wrath of God? Well, first of all, we understood that the wrath of God is man's true and ultimate crisis, his true and ultimate dilemma. We stress that reality, brothers and sisters, because as you know, in this life, we will have many tribulations. We will have many trials. In this world, we will have distress. In this world, we will have trouble. And this world, this culture will tell you that your biggest problem in this life is that you're not happy. The biggest problem that you have in this life is that you're not healthy. Your biggest problem in this life is that you don't have good relationships, you don't have good emotions, you do not have a good state of mind, or you do not have a good standard of living. And so all this world is conditioned of answering those felt needs. But the Bible tells us the ultimate crisis of man does not consist in your circumstances or your emotional state of mind or your your psychological state of mind. But it's ultimately religious. Isn't that amazing? A world that tries every which way that it can To remove God from you can never remove the fact that your greatest problem is your lack 
of knowing God, of having a relationship with God. And there's nothing in this world that can help you with that. The only thing that can help you with your greatest need, with man's greatest crisis, their greatest dilemma, is the grace of God. Now, we understand that for the Apostle Paul, he is interacting with a specific audience in the book of Romans. He's interacting with Jews, he's interacting with Gentiles, and he's interacting with Jews and Gentiles that are having a hard time getting along. And of course, the Jewish person is going to hear the words of the gospel, and they're going to make certain objections. And one of those objections is that we're Jews, and we have special favor with God. But look at verse 9. He says, what then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, everyone, Jews and Greeks, everyone is under sin. So there you go. It doesn't matter if you're a Jewish person. You are not in any better position than a Greek person or a Gentile person as it relates to your standing before God. But he's also, therefore, eliminated this idea that anyone will ever be justified by the works of the law. Look at verse 20. Verse 20. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in, the, in his sight, in God's sight. Since through the law, the, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin, or comes knowledge of sin. Now what's interesting here is that the Apostle Paul is picking up where he left off there in verse 20 in terms of no human being, no person, Uh, Literally, the Greek word here is no flesh. No flesh will be justified by works. Now, as we approach this context, verses 23 to 26, now we broke right in the middle of a critical section, verse 21 and 22. And we broke off there because really verse 23 kind of belongs to the very end of verse 22, where he says, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But right there, he begins to introduce a whole nother idea than what he said previously in terms of the revelation of the righteousness of God. But it's all connected. I want you to see that. Look at verse 21. The righteousness of God, if it doesn't come by keeping the law, if you cannot earn it, if you cannot do it, then where does this righteousness come from? And how will we obtain it? And verse 21 says, the righteousness of God has been manifested. Look at, uh, look at verse 25 here, when he says, this was to show God's righteousness. You see that? Look at verse 26. It was to show his righteousness at the present time. And so we talked about that last time, that what we're looking at, verses 21 to 26, is an unveiling, a revelation, a manifestation, a showing of the righteousness of God. And we talked about what does Paul mean here by the righteousness of God, but he means something like, how will sinners who are under sin who are under the condemnation of the law, how will sinners obtain the righteousness of God if it's not by works, if it's not by heritage, if it's not by ethnicity, if it's not by simply belonging to the old covenant people Israel, how is it obtained? And of course, you are Christians today, and you know how it is obtained. It is obtained through Jesus Christ. But here's the question. This passage is going to help us answer the question, but why? Why is it obtained through Jesus Christ? Now, I want to give you three very, very simple, that's four, three. I'll give you three very basic principles of what Paul is trying to stress here. Number one is the principle of sin and grace. And that's found right here in verse 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And as you think about what Paul just said there, there is number one, the universal reality of sin. Everyone, as we have said, 
everyone is under this universal uh, uh, condemnation of sin. And I, I know that you know that. But notice what he says here. It is because they have fallen short of the glory of God. And so when, when, when you are sharing the gospel, let's say, when you are sharing the gospel, what you are sharing with people is a very personal message. You are not telling people that their problem is that they have broken the law, a law, and that because they have failed to measure up to a standard, they are in trouble. But brothers and sisters, it's more than that. They are in trouble with a person because they have fallen short of the glory of God. And so when it says they have fallen short of the glory of God, this is Paul's way of saying sin is personal. You have offended God himself. What does it mean to fall short of God's glory? What does it mean to fall short of God's glory? Well, it literally means that you are living in contradiction to the glory of God. What is the glory of God? Perfection. Moral perfection. Spiritual perfection. Perfection in every way. Perfection in terms of the creator and creature distinction. Perfection in terms of the creator-creature relationship. And sin comes in and destroys all of that. And so this is what it means to fall short of the glory of God. You are undermining the very nature of God and the very nature of the way that God made everything. You are falling short of God's standard. It is God whom man has offended. And so when you share the gospel with someone, don't fail to make it as personal as you can. You, my friend, in a witnessing situation, you have offended God. You, he is offended by you, by the way that you have lived. And if you want help with that, just look at his law and understand precisely why, where, and how you have offended him. Because, of course, his law is nothing other than a reflection of his perfect pure, holy, righteous nature. And that's why in the principle of sin and grace, not only is there the universal reality of sin, but listen, there's also the universal need of grace. Everyone, what does verse 23 say? Or what is verse 23 teaching us? It's teaching us, yes, everyone has sinned, absolutely. But here's the thing, if you look at what happened in the previous verses, Man is powerless. He is powerless to overcome this. There's nothing he can do. There's nothing that we can do to overpower this at this point. We are under sin. The law has taught us the knowledge of sin. We are in trouble with God. And God is going to judge us on the basis of our sin. And so what has God done in order for us to remedy this condition? Well, he has provided a gift. Look at verse 24. He has provided a gift. And he says, now all have sinned, but they're justified by his grace as a gift. That's a glorious statement, isn't that? Uh, it's kind of remarkable. The only other place I can think about where God has explicitly provided a gift is in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, I think it's verse 15. And there the context of 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 is all about tithing and giving and uh, giving offerings to the church. And Paul concludes with, who can outgive God? God has given us what? An indescribable gift in his son Jesus Christ. But here, his gift is what he has provided in Jesus Christ that takes away our sin, namely this redemption. Now, the first principle is the principle of sin and grace. Sin puts us in this condition. Grace shows us our need 
Grace shows us that God is going gonna, is gonna to remedy our condition through a gift, not of ourselves. But the next principle is the principle of propitiation. That's a big theological word that every single one of you must master. You must master this word propitiation. In the Greek, it is hilasterion. And hilasterion has a a varied uh, type of meaning. But the principle of God's grace and the principle of propitiation reminds us, brothers and sisters, that God saves us not by some random act of kindness. I think if you talk to the average person on the street and ask them why God did this, how is it that God saves mankind? Why did God choose to send his son? I think most people would fall miserably short of the real reason. I think people would just say, well, because God is kind and well, because God is good and well, because God loves us. But it doesn't quite get to the essence of it, does it? And propitiation is a word where we find the very logic. Brothers and sisters, listen, I would say in the word propitiation, we find some of the deepest logic of the gospel itself. The deepest logic. That the gospel, salvation, the grace of God, these are not, this is not just a random act of God, a random act of kindness on God's part. It it would be enough to say that God simply chose to be kind to sinners. It would be enough to say, well, God just wanted to be merciful because, after all, God is God. He can do whatever He wants. But it doesn't really tell us the biblical idea. It doesn't really tell us the biblical story. It doesn't account for who God is, namely that God is just, infinitely just, That God is holy, infinitely holy. And this is where propitiation comes in. Where does this idea of propitiation come from? Well, propitiation, the Greek word helisterion, just means what? It's kind of an interesting word. Look it up in in a lexicon or look it up in a Greek dictionary or look it up in a commentary. The word helisterion literally means place of forgiveness or place of mercy. And in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 5, there the author of Hebrews translates hilasterion, the same Greek word, translates it as what? The mercy seat. See how it is a place? See how it is a thing associated with the mercy and the forgiveness of God? And where does that come from? Well, of course, that comes directly from Leviticus chapter 16 and what will turn out to be in Leviticus a whole exposition on the Day of Atonement and how the mercy seat was situated within the tabernacle, within the temple of God as the place where atonement was ultimately offered for the people of God. And so this word mercy seat, place of forgiveness, propitiation, carries the idea of expiation. Write that down. Expiation is this idea of removing your sins from you. Isn't that exactly what we just started building up, saying this is what man needs? Man needs the removal of this greatest of all religious dilemmas, that they are not right with God. Remember Genesis Day one, it was good. Day two, it was good. Day three, it was good. Good, 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 good. And then I think day six, it was very good. What does sin tell us? It was bad. It was bad. It was bad. It was very bad. How are we going to get back to good? More than that, how are we going to get back to righteous? It's only going to happen by somehow our sins being expiated from us. The term is therefore cultic. You know what I mean by cultic? It belongs to the cultus of Israel. The, in other words, the ritual life of Israel, which is the sacrificial system. This term, uh, or this term, this, this idea here, propitiation... It also refers to a process, listen carefully now, 
It refers to a process by which a person can be made to be favorably disposed to others. Listen to me very carefully here, because propitiation, we understand that propitiation means something like expiation, removing sin, or removing wrath, and we'll get to that. But it also carries this concept of favor, favor. In other words, in the context of Romans and in the biblical sense, propitiation is the idea that we propitiate God. God is being propitiated. He is being appeased so that he will be favorably disposed to us. You see that? And therefore, propitiation ultimately carries this idea of removing God's displeasure, removing his wrath, and simultaneously, propitiation involves the idea of reconciliation, that God has taken sinful man and, and his holy righteousness, and he has brought them back together in a, in a good, peaceful a friendly relationship again. Propitiation implicates reconciliation. Propitiation ultimately carries a deeply redemptive historical meaning. By redemptive historical, I mean as we see the history of the Bible unfolding in terms of the process of how God's salvation is revealed Throughout that history, we see that from the very beginning, that history slowly, slowly, but surely is being unveiled more and more and more. Isn't that what Paul says here? Verse 21, the righteousness of God has been manifested. Phanareo. It has been revealed, in other words. Later, he's going to say, it has been shown. There is an unveiling. And therefore, when we think about the work of Christ, we think about propitiation, what Paul is saying here in connection to the Levitical mercy seat of the temple and of the cultists of Israel, then what we're seeing here is a progression in redemptive history that centers and culminates and terminates upon the person and work of Jesus Christ, showing us again and again what I've taught you many times, that all of that typological foreshadowing of the Levitical system, the foreshadowing of the work of Christ, of the sacrifice of Christ, is fulfilled at the cross. Douglas Moo, a commentator on Romans, had this to say, and I thought it was brilliant. Doug Moo says, by referring to Christ as this mercy seat, Paul would be inviting us to view Christ as the new covenant equivalent or antitype of this old covenant place of atonement and derivatively to the ritual of the atonement itself. What in the Old Testament was hidden from public view, listen, being behind the veil has now been publicly displayed as the Old Testament ritual is fulfilled and brought to an end in Christ's once for all sacrifice. That is worthy of a thousand sermons. Because what he's saying was, in the Old Testament times, types and shadow and the symbolism of that time, the ultimate atonement, the ultimate propitiation, the ultimate satisfaction for the wrath of God was done behind the veil where no one could see it. But what does this say? Look at verse 25 here. It says, but God put forward his son, right? God put him forward as a propitiation. Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus was put forward. And see that word put forward? I don't know what your Bible says. But that Greek word there, put forward, is a word that can also be translated publicly displayed. It's an interesting word, but it just speaks of forward and this idea of being out in the open. 
Is, and so that's why Doug Moo is saying, look, what had been hidden for millennia, for millennia. I mean, you think America's been around for a long time? It's been, what, I don't know, 300 years or so, little, maybe a little less? Uh, this, this idea, it was hidden for centuries and centuries and centuries and centuries. Where it was behind the veil, it was before the presence of God in the inner sanctuary of the Holy of Holies. And there, there, the deepest mystery of redemption was found But that deepest of all mysteries has now been unveiled for the whole world to see in the person and work of Jesus Christ on the cross. It is as if God broke the Holy of Holies open and showed the whole world how redemption works. And... There's another thing here, because in this remarkable work of propitiation, some of the deepest contours, some of the deepest dimensions of our salvation are found. Number one, Paul, and I've got, I've got about five points here real quick. Paul explicitly makes God the Father, the source of the provision of propitiation. What does it say here? It says, God, you see that? Verse 25, God put forward Jesus Christ to be a propitiation. God is the one offering. It's it's almost like God is the ultimate priest who makes the ultimate offer and brings the ultimate sacrifice of His Son. Only God can provide the sacrifice that will satisfy His wrath and His justice in His own Son. And of course, the sacrifice of Jesus is a triune work. Is it not? Isn't it a triune work? Because if the book of Hebrews tells us anything, it's that Jesus Christ is our high priest. Amen? He is our high priest who sits at the right hand of God to make intercession for us forever. But what about the Spirit? We're also told in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14 and 15, we're also told there, verse 14, that the Spirit is the, the Trinitarian person that literally empowered. He was the agency through which the Son makes atonement. It was through the eternal Spirit that Jesus offered His Son so that Father, Son, and Spirit are all implicated in the work of atonement. The second thing is is that this satisfaction is made through a blood sacrifice. Why? Well, because Leviticus tells us explicitly, Leviticus 17, 11, we are told that the life of the flesh is in the blood. And so a life must be given. And this simultaneously, instantaneously, therefore, connects us to the idea of the vicarious atonement of Jesus Christ. Vicarious just means Jesus did it in our place, in our stead, uh, to use covenantal language, as our surety. As our surety just means that he was the down payment. He was, he was what secures our redemption. He is the one that paid the price so that we can go free. And so Jesus Christ does his sacrificial work so that it is life for life. A life for the life of his people. One act of obedience, Paul will go on to say, Romans chapter 5, uh, verse 12 to 18 or 19. Paul will go on to say, by one work, one act of obedience, one act of righteousness, the many are made righteous. He laid down his life so that we might live. Third, This work of propitiation only strengthens the logic of faith because it puts the work of propitiation out of our grasp. We cannot do it. It was not the people of Israel that atoned. Remember? It was the high priest. 
He went in as their representative. The people were outside. They were not able to atone for themselves. They needed somebody to bring that atonement as a mediator. And that's exactly who Jesus is. This is how wrath is satisfied. Not by the works of the law, you can't earn it. Not by the works of the law, you can't perform it. Not by duty. And you don't keep yourself either by duty. You don't, it's not that you get in by grace and then you stay there by, by works. No. It is by grace alone, through faith alone, from start to finish. That is the gospel. Now, fourth, exegetically, this connects us back to Paul's concept that the righteousness of God has been manifested. And again, he will say in verse 25, it has been shown. And again, in verse 26, it is to show the righteousness at the present time. What that tells us, brothers, here, follow me very carefully here. But what this tells us is that the redemptive historical significance of Jesus' death means that the Old Testament sacrifices were both provisional and they were proleptic. And people were like, what did the pastor just say? Well, write it down. (laughs) But number one, it is provisional. It is something that God temporarily provided uh, for his people to sustain them. A wilderness generation. A generation that was awaiting the fullness. But it was also proleptic. What does the word proleptic mean? It means that it was also anticipating something greater. It was provisional. God provided a sacrificial system for his people. And it was proleptic because that that sacrificial system was also looking forward to something greater than itself. We are told in Hebrews chapter 10 verses 1 through 10. Write that down. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 1 through 10. We are told that those kind of Old Testament sacrifices can never take away sins. They can never perfect the worshiper. We need a better sacrifice. Number five. Now, this one we have to spend some time on. Propitiation. The propitiation that was shown, manifested, revealed, explains why God would allow so much sin to seemingly go unpunished for millennia. And what could possibly motivate God to allow the world to sinfully go on and on and on? You ever feel like that? You ever look at the news and see something so wicked that you ask yourself, like a true son of thunder, daughter of thunder, why doesn't God just come and just burn everybody already? Well, why, why doesn't God just judge this wicked, vile world already? Maybe you don't hate sin enough to say that. But the disciples did. Moses did, remember? Moses got so tired of the abominations of the people, he said, Lord, forget it, I give up. Thank you for hiring me as a mediator, but please... Go have your way with them. Just destroy, wipe them off the face of the earth. They don't deserve anything. That's exactly what God wanted to show Moses. The people don't deserve what I'm about to do for them. Any more than we do what Christ did for us. But this is important not just to explain how God could be motivated to pass over the former sins. Here, look look with me, please. Verse 25. He says here, Jesus Christ was put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith, everything we've been talking about. This was to show God's righteousness. Here it is. Because in his divine forbearance, he passed over former sins. This was to show his righteousness at the present time. And so the questions then come in 
Why is it that these sins seemingly of the Old Testament, even around the time of the people of Romans, why is it that God did not fully deal with these sins? Now, the issues that are involved here are twofold. Number one, write it down, covenantal, and number two, eschatological. How do you know if you're supposed to write this down? If the pastor comes up to you after and asks you about it, and you don't know what I'm even talking about. <laughs> That's why you write it down. <laughs> Some of y'all can make mental notes. But I really want you to understand the issues involved here. They are covenantal and they are eschatological. Now, we say covenantal because as we move away from the old into the new, as we're moving away from the types and shadows, from the provisional, the temporal, the typological, the symbolic, in keeping with those types and shadows, the author of Hebrews, remember, says, can never take away sin. And we're moving to the fulfillment. We're moving to the fullness. We're moving to the reality and to the actual substance of these things in Christ. We are moving away from the temporal and we are moving to the eternal. To the eternal. Why do we also say, therefore, that it is eschatological? Here, here, I want you to look at Romans here again, and I want you to zero in on that phrase, divine forbearance. Divine forbearance is a matter of wrath and judgment. It, 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 it beckons us to think upon God's future dealings with man. While he forbears, God is expected to execute justice on the earth, which will vindicate the, the righteous and will spell doom for the wicked. The old covenant people did not see this fulfilled in their time. But there's an obvious question here, because it's been 2,000 years, beloved. It has been 2,000 years since the advent of Jesus, and we have not seen the ultimate fulfillment of the judgment of God either. So how do we differ from those generations prior to, prior to us? Now the answer is found in the cross. And I want you to do me a favor. Turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. The manifestation of God's righteousness. That's what we're looking at in propitiation. Not only in the ending of the world where the righteousness of God will be revealed. You're going to see the righteousness of God. At the great judgment, you'll stand there and see people judged righteously. There will be no questions. There will be no fighting. There will be no debating. There will be no reasoning. There will be no quibbling over details. And there will be no lawyers. Praise God, no more lawyers. There will be no, no more human court systems to decide the matter. Artificial intelligence will not decide the matter. But only the eternal divine counsel of God in all of his infinite righteousness will bring the world to a final judgment and render that judgment with eternal definitiveness. Isn't it awesome to think about? It means also that in Christ, the principle of the sacrifice of Christ, this propitiation on the cross, the final judgment has already been revealed. And listen, it has already been experienced. So I want to teleport you and take you all the way to the final judgment where we're standing in front of the throne of God and we're seeing the great and awesome, terrible judgment of the great white throne. And then I want to take you from that scene and teleport you back to 33 A.D. or so. 
and sit you down at the foot of the cross and tell you, you are looking at the same thing, the judgment of God. And if you look at Hebrews chapter 9, that is exactly what Hebrews is saying. It's one of those verses that a lot of Christians memorize. Verse 27, it is appointed for man once to die, after that the judgment, right? How many of you can quote that from memory? Probably a lot of us. Can you quote the context by memory? (laughs) Probably not a lot of us. (laughs) But the context is critical because this is not just a saying, a catchy saying that sounds good when you're doing street preaching. The context is the very essence of the work of Christ on the cross as it pertains to propitiation. And it means that the final judgment has already come. The divine forbearance of God was over. It ran out at the cross. Look at verse 25. Well, I'm sorry, folks. I'm sorry. I have to take you to verse 23. Ready? Let's just work real fast and then we're done. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. That's talking about the work of Christ. Why is it sacrifices, plural? Because he embodies all the sacrifices of the old covenant system. Verse 24, for Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, not the tabernacle, not the temple, which are copies, they're just replicas of the true things. But in heaven itself, that's the true thing. That's the original. Now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy place every year with blood not his own. If he had to do what the Old Testament priest did, he would be doing it over and over and over and over. But his sacrifice is different. He says, for then he would have to suffer repeatedly, see, since the foundation of the world. But as as it is, he has appeared once for all, watch this guys now, at the end of the ages. (laughs) You You want to spend an afternoon Meditating on something truly (laughs) interdimensional? Just look at that, okay? Just read this, right? At the end of the ages, plural, to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. What is propitiation? It is the sacrifice of the Son himself. Why is it covenantal? Because we're moving from old covenant to new covenant, Why is it eschatological? Right here. Because we are seeing something that brings together all the ages. What ages? The present evil age going all the way back to Adam. And the age to come, the final judgment is brought down to the cross. That's why he says, verse 27, and just as it is appointed for man once to die, and after that comes what? Judgment. That's what Jesus has done. As he's brought all the sins of all this age, and he's brought all the judgment of the age to come, and he brought it into himself at the cross, where he dealt once and for all for man's judgment. That is propitiation. Propitiation is removing the wrath of God from us that will be poured out upon us on the day of judgment, and Jesus removes it by bringing the day of judgment to himself at the cross. These are the ages convening upon 
Christ. You want to see what the judgment of God looks like? Don't look at a nuclear bomb. You want to see what the wrath of God looks like? Don't look at a volcano, a hurricane, a tornado, an earthquake. You want to see what the wrath of God looks like? Look at the cross. Look at the anguish of the cross because by looking at the anguish of the cross, you are getting a divine preview of the wrath of God being poured out on sinners. And what happens next? Oh man, look at verse 28. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, that's propitiation, he will appear a second time. But when he appears a second time, he is not coming to deal with sin. That's already been dealt with at the cross. So then what is he coming for? He's coming to save those who eagerly wait for him. In other words, he comes back as the judge. The judge of the living and the dead at the parousia judgment of Jesus Christ, the second coming. If he doesn't bear the wrath of God, if he doesn't bear the judgment of God for you, if you do not believe in him, Romans, then he will return as your judge and he will execute judgment upon the world, the very judgment that he underwent at the cross. I think my thing, did it just die? I killed it. No? You hear it? It's okay? It blew out? You can still hear me? The wrath of God is on this thing. <laughs> what does this mean for the gospel? I'll tell you exactly what it means for the gospel. Go back to Romans chapter 3. What it means for the gospel is that we don't have a God who is doing things randomly. We have a God that is doing everything. Check, check, check. God is doing everything for his own glory. Look at verse 26. It is to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just. There we go. A statement of being, the being of God, his nature, his life, his existence, who he is, what he is like, what is in God. He is just. And simultaneously, the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You ever hear an unbeliever? You ever hear a person you're trying to evangelize or talk to say the most blasphemous things when they say, so God can just forgive you for your sins? All I have to do is become a Christian? All I need to do is just believe in this gospel that you're talking about? You hear sinners talk like that? And, you're, and, and hopefully now with this sermon, maybe a little bit more you can understand the depth of how wrong that is to understand. Do you understand what God did so that in justifying sinners like you, if you repent, he remains just. His justice does not change, right? And because God's justice does not change. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. Because God does not change, we are not consumed. This, this gospel that we believe in is the gospel of God, Paul says. Romans chapter 1, verse 1. 
It is the gospel of God. The gospel is ultimately telling us something about God. What he is, who he is, how he saves, and how he remains God when he saves. He does not, by saving people, by saving sinners, God does not come down and become something else. Unjust. There's kind of an exception to God. This caveat, right? He suspends his godhood. He turns a blind eye to sin. Absolutely not. God remains who he is for all eternity, even in the salvation of sinners like you and I. That's what the gospel is. God is just so that his nature is protected. And God is justifier so that through the cross, and here I'm going to use a phrase maybe you've never heard, the eschatological cross, Hebrews chapter 9, because that's what the cross was. It was eschatology intruding into this world at the cross, the final judgment. In the cross, provision was made that can justify us by faith alone. (sighs) Happy Mother's Day. I don't have anything better for mothers than that. And I feel strangely that moms will be satisfied with that, even though I didn't preach a Mother's Day sermon. What could be greater than Mother's Day celebrating propitiation? You want to blow your friends away at work or at the family? What did you do for Mother's Day? Oh, propitiation. (laughs) It'd be a strange mom, a godly mom. Happy Mother's Day. Let's, Let's pray together. Father, Lord, we thank you so much. Thank you for the gospel of your son. Thank you that ultimate judgment has been dealt with. Thank you that the terrible wrath of God upon sin has been satisfied by the glorious cross of your son Jesus. And now we understand the depth of what Paul says, that it has been provided for us as a gift, the glorious gift of God, and that all of these glorious things are seen and understood in the face of Jesus Christ, who is the Savior of all mankind, especially of those who believe. In his name we pray. Amen.